Well, it's nice to be back with you again uh, this evening. Tell you a wee story before we, we start. Um, there was a period in my life where I walked away from the Lord for what I thought would be maybe just a few weeks or a couple of months, and it turned out to be 14 years. Uh, while I was away, I met my wife, who's at the back there, never told her of any of my involvement with church or anything else. We went through a period where in one year we had nine bereavements in the immediate family and the second last of them was my sister-in-law at the age of 37 who was dying of cancer and the week before she died uh, she asked if I would take her funeral service. I couldn't be a hypocrite so I went through to the glow centre in Motherwell uh, and I bought a Bible and I bought a CD of worship songs and within a few days I had said to Jill I, I want to go back to the church and fully expected her to say well on you go but no we all went and within nine months my wife was saved Within two years, my daughter, who's at the back, was saved. Year passed. In August, Jack, my son, was saved. And I've had the privilege of baptizing them all, which is something that I never expected. And I can tell you something. Don't ever be tempted to take time away. Not a good idea. Even though circumstances can be very difficult, I should have turned to the Lord, and I didn't. I turned from Him. But even in the midst of difficult circumstances, God brought about some wonderful things. And normally, Abby would have sang with Jack that she is tonsillitis or the, the remnants of it, and they normally sing together and I have the privilege of opening God's word on a regular basis. The way I look at it is very simple. I'm just a message boy. I get the message, I don't change it, I don't alter it. I just deliver it. And then that's my, my bit done. And you know one of the problems we have in the churches these days is there are so many people who want to build their ministry and they want to promote their name. Nothing about them. Nothing about me, or Jack, or Abby, or anyone else. It's all about the Lord. And if we don't do it for His glory, we've got it seriously, seriously wrong. And you know, sometimes we've seen, sadly, in our experience uh, as Christians... You can see individuals uh, and they're going down a certain direction and you can warn them and they don't listen and you know exactly what's going to happen unless they change and it happens. I'll tell you one more story and then we'll read the scriptures. I have a friend who I've known since I probably was about 16. He's the brother that I never had and was greatly involved in church work leading worship. And then he did the same as I did. Not at the exact same time, but not far away. And his life spiraled out of control. He just missed going to prison. And really, he wasn't the nicest of person to be about. And when I came back to the Lord, I, would, I would tried to tell him, you know, why don't you? And the answer was, that's fine for you, but not for me. About six months ago, I got a phone call, and it was Tam. And he said to me, guess where I was yesterday? And my immediate thought was, I dread to think where you were. And he said, I was at the church. And he too has come back to the Lord. And his ministry of leading worship has been restored to him. And for that, we are very, very grateful. 
the Lord can use those who allow him to and who give those who give him their all. There is nothing more frustrating than trying to do Christian work in your own strength. It doesn't work. We're going to turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I need my specs these days. Revelation 21, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be their God and be with them. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him who is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, who had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone. And had a great and high wall, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the west three gates, on the north three gates, and the south three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs. And the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear gla glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the sixth sardonyx, the seventh, the, the sixth Tardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth Topaz, and the tenth I can never pronounce, so I'm not going to try. The eleventh was Jacinth, and the twelfth was an am Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and the street of the city was of pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the, of the sun, neither the moon, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. 
and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for they shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations unto it. And there shall be no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or makes a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every one. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they no longer need candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I wonder if there's any of us here this evening who does not believe in one way or another that there is life after there is there is life after this life is extinguished. It would seem that it is almost the universal dream of mankind. With the atheists and the humanists in exception, that people want to believe that there is something after this life. Surely, this life is not all that there is to it. It seems to be built in to the very psyche of human nature. So, you would believe, would you not, that if that was the case, the Bible would tell us so. And guess what? It does. When God made man, and yes, I do believe in creation, when God made man, he did something to mankind that he didn't do to any other of his creation. We are told that when he made Adam, he breathed into Adam's nostrils, and man became a living soul. God gave us an eternal quality to us. The soul, the real you and me. You know, very often we think of the person that we are is just what we see looking back when we look in a mirror. And there's not many people who like what they see for various reasons. But that's, that's just the case, so to speak. The real you is the bit that lives forever that was created by God and that will never ever die most faiths would tell us of some kind of afterlife but you know there is one thing that differentiates Christianity from every other religion and I don't know if you know what that is it's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ there is no so-called leader of any other faith who ever rose from the dead, but the Lord Jesus did. And we are told that when he had risen, he was seen by the disciples and 500 other witnesses. You only need two in a court of law. So basically what God was doing was saying, listen, here you are, all of these people, have seen the risen Savior. And I wonder this evening, as we have gathered here, I wonder who has seen the risen Savior. And by that I mean who has come to understand what Christ did for them on the cross. Jesus presented himself. You see, round about the cross, his crucifixion, his resurrection, he was the instigator. He gave up his life. No one took it from him. 
When he rose from the grave, no one was there to help him. And then he appeared to all of these witnesses. And because the Lord lives, then we can live also. Not just for time, but for all eternity. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Who, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So, the scripture says very clearly, one way or another, we will live on. Either in the presence of our Savior in heaven, or in the place that the Bible describes as hell. The place where God is not, and sin is plentiful, and sinners in an unnumbered crowd. Yes, I do believe in hell. And in these days, in Christian churches, sadly, there are many issues that people are very quick to try to brush under the carpet. Oh, you can't tell people about hell these days. You'll offend them. Well, you would hope you would, because that's exactly what the gospel message is all about. It was never meant to appease people. It was never meant to be pleasant to their ears. Scripture says, the message of the cross stirs up anger and resentment in the hearts of sinners because they don't want to know of their own condition. But you know what I want to do this evening? I want us to look just for a few moments or so at the subject of what awaits us when our earthly life is over one way or another. The word heaven appears approximately 600 times in the pages of Scripture. Now, I didn't count them. Someone else has, and I pinched their idea. And it's used to describe three different particular heavens. Let me explain what I mean by that. Firstly, there's the atmosphere, the sky, the clouds. We refer to that often as heaven. And then there's outer space, the stars, the planets, etc. These, too, are known as the heavens. But then there is the third heaven. And the third heaven is the place where God dwells. And you may recall in one of Paul's letters, he speaks of how he was taken there. He couldn't explain how exactly how it was, but he experienced a place that was so beautiful. He was taken into the third heaven. And he wasn't even allowed to share what he saw. Oh, it must have been wonderful. And that is the place where if, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you will go in a coming day, without any doubt whatsoever. But if you're here and you don't know the Savior, and you don't do anything about it, you will never darken the door of the place called heaven. Do you know, I believe in the rapture, and I trust you know what I mean by that. I believe there is a coming day when the Lord will come to the clouds of the air, and the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and from there he will take us into our eternal home, into his immediate and into his glorious presence. Who will take part in the rapture? You know already. Only those who have been born again of the Spirit of God. And I wonder what your great hopes are in life. I wonder what it is that you trust and in whom you trust for the future. Because I'm learning very, very, very quickly that life passes by at a fair rate of knots. 
and you look back to things that you did 30 years ago and they seem as if they were just yesterday. Time stops for no man. It marches on. But there is one thing that is absolutely certain. One day it will cease. One day all of this old creation will be wrapped up and be done with. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth where God will reign. Why is it important for Christians to keep in the forefront of their minds this wonderful promise of an eternal home? Why is that important? Is that just for weak people who can't face the realities of life? No, it's not. If we live our life with the thought of heaven being a prospect for us at any given moment, it will have an effect on our everyday life. You see, a, a genuine and a real longing for, for heaven brings about in us the desire to live the noblest of Christian lives. Brings about that within us that makes us live a life that will bring glory to the name of our Savior. A longing for heaven brings us joy in the midst of trial and in the midst of difficulty. A longing for heaven is a strong preservative against sin. And yes, even Christians sin. And if you don't, I'll be here at the end. Please come and tell me how you do it. But we know from Scripture that for the believer, when we fall and we sin, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A longing for heaven will bring a sense of vigor to our spiritual life. There's at no time in our Christian life should we dig out the sun lounger. Neither should we ever think about retirement because there's none. One way or another, we serve the Lord as he has called us to, either till the day he takes us to be with himself or the day that we meet him in the air. But really, a, a strong desire for heaven honors God. When we long to live for the Lord and we look forward to that place, we are honoring him in all that we do. You see, some would tell us that heaven is just some kind of spiritual consciousness. You know, they kind of sit in white fluffy clouds and strum harps. That's not the heaven of the Bible. Absolutely not. And the people who suggest that are the kind of people that believe that nothing went bang and became something that brought this world into being. How stupid could you be? But these are the people who try to tell us that really heaven is nothing than just a place of spiritual consciousness. Scripture is very clear. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. No doubts, no maybes, no could bes. And that word new in the original language is the word kainos. And you may say, well, why is that important? Well, let me try to explain. It doesn't mean new in the chronological sense. It means new in the qualitative sense. In other words, the quality of what lies ahead is far, far better than anything we can know in the here and now. And that is the place that our Savior has gone on to prepare for us. Scripture says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Now the dwelling place of God is with men, 
and he shall be with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Did you see the phrase, the dwelling place of God? All distance gone, not through a, gl a glass darkly. And I believe it will be the fulfillment of what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's our privilege as believers. An absolute certainty. So what will it be like to dwell in the presence of our God? Well, I tell you what will be gone. All the debates as whether we have seats or pews, whether we use sankeys, whatever, mission praise, whatever hymn book you want to think of, versions of the Bible, these will all be gone. And these are the things that churches have fallen out with for many, many years. And Christians have disagreed with one another. All these things finished. They'll never be issues again. In fact, they will seem so childish when we stand before our Savior. One of the things we'll enjoy is fellowship with God. Far better than the sin-hindered fellowship that we have while we are down here. But the, the Bible says that as believers we shall see God. And how do we know that? Because the Bible tells us so. Very simple. Very straightforward. Scripture says, dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As clearly as I see you and as you see me. Thirdly, we will worship God. It will be pure worship, not the sin-hindered worship that we offer here. Jesus says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. We'll offer that worship in all its perfection when we get to heaven. One glorious day. Fourthly, the believer will serve God in the new heavens and the new earth. Scripture speaks of the saints in heaven serving their God by day and by night. One of the things that believers will face when the rapture has taken place and the church is taken into the presence of her Savior is the judgment seat of Christ. And somebody once said to me, Christians won't be judged. Oh, yes, they will. Not their sins. They are dealt with past, present, future. But their works, from the moment that you have trusted Christ as Savior, you have been given something by God for you to do for His glory. And all we are asked to do is to serve Him faithfully. When we get to glory, the Lord wants the millennial kingdom comes into being the thousand-year reign of Christ from Jerusalem, we shall rule and reign with him. And the amount of responsibility we will be given then will be according to our faithfulness now. So if we are faithful in little now, the responsibility that will be given to us will not be great. If we are faithful in much, much responsibility will be given to the faithful. But there's something else that happens when we get to heaven. And read Luke 12 verses 35 to 40 before you put the light out tonight. It tells the parable of the rich nobleman who went in to a far country, left his servants to serve faithfully. He was away for a long, long time. When he came back and he found his servants 
serving faithfully. He threw a celebration, a feast, and he served his servant. And you know something? There's a great feast that will take place in glory. And I'll join you round that table if you know the Savior. And the Lord will serve his people. How amazing is that? I often wonder why there's so many miserable Christians about. And believe me, I see an awful lot of them on a daily basis. We should be excited about our Savior. And about the prospects that lie ahead. This is not something we should hide in a corner. It should be shouted from the rooftops. Jesus Christ is coming again. And one day we shall be with him. What will the differences be when we get to heaven? Far, far different than here. There will be no weeping. No sorrow. No sickness. And the one I'm looking forward to most, no pain. No painful separations. All these things will be done with and gone. Why? Because the Bible tells us that the first things have passed away. And listen to this. He who sits upon the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And who sits on the throne? Work it out for yourself. Do you know, at one point in the book of the Revelation, there's a majestic voice from heaven that cries, It is done. And you know, as I, I think of these words, uh, and with the work I'm involved in, I spend an awful lot of time on all matters with, to do with Bible prophecy. I can never help but think, as I read these words, of another great declaration that was made from the cross. It is finished. What was finished? The sin question had been dealt with. The way was open for men and women to return to God and have their sins forgiven and fellowship restored. When we get to this declaration, which is yet future, when the Lord says it is done, what's done? Redemptive history is done. And we step into all things eternal. Time will be no more. And you know, as we read... In the book of the Revelation, there is the new Jerusalem described as coming out down from heaven as the bride. And you might be saying, well, why can, how on earth can you call a city a bride? Well, let me try and explain it very simply. What's being spoken of here is not so much the city, but of those who dwell within the city. And if you're a Christian, that will be you and that will be me. And some folks have said, and they may not be wrong, that this new Jerusalem will be the capital city of the new heavens and the new earth. Think about that one just for a moment or two. It's interesting that Isaiah the prophet said something many, many, many years ago. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor brightness will the moon give you light. But you have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Then, of course, we had all the descriptions of the precious stones. As John saw the city from the outside of the gate, of the gates of pearl, every gate one single pearl, of the angels at the gates, we were given sizes of, of the walls and the heights of the walls. This is a big place that's going to come down with us from glory. And we have to be very careful that we don't go for baseless speculation 
That's where Bible prophecy has suffered over the years, where people have made claims that really were never meant to be made. It speaks of a great and high wall. Here's another explanation as to why this place is not just some kind of nebulous zone. This is a real place. The 12 foundation stones on each one, there is the name of the 12 disciples. Why? I believe it will remind us through all the eons of eternity of the, the, the work that these men did in, in going out with the gospel and only one of them died a natural death. On the gates, there is a name of each one had the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? To remind us for all eternity that salvation came from the Jews. These are simple things. And they are worth remembering. We are told that these streets were as pure gold, clear as glass. And an interesting thing, there's no temple. So where will all these Christians go? You know, I think sometimes when you speak to some people, you think they'll be a wee bit for the Baptists, and they'll be a wee bit for the Brethren, and they'll be a wee bit for all. No, no, no. There's no need for a temple. Why? Because the Scripture says that the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. They are the center of everyone's attention. And all, instead of being drawn to one another and all our failings, which will, of course, be gone anyway, our focus will be on the Lamb of God, our precious, precious Savior. We're told that the, there is, in the internal part of the city, there is the river of the water of life. And, of course, the commentators argue, is it a literal river? Is it a symbolic river? Listen, to the bridge, and a river's a river, and that's good enough for me. There's no point in arguing about it. We're told it's clear, and it proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. What does that speak of? Blessings for all eternity, unending, like we've never, ever known before. Let me very, very quickly finish when we consider the privileges of the city's inhabitants. And John repeats an earlier description of heaven's magnificence and it gives us almost one last glimpse of heaven and hope. And there shall be no longer any night and they will not need the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. And then there's the final crescendo. It will never, never end. Think of that. Everything in life has an end. That's just the way it is. Not when we get to glory. It will never end. We will never tire of its beauty. We go to Northumberland on holiday and have done since I was nine, which you have gathered was a few decades ago by now. And I don't know if you know the coastal road in Northumberland as you go down into Bamborough. There's a magnificent castle sits high on the rock. And you know, the first time we saw it, you thought, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. We'll never get used to it. But you do. It's still wonderful to look at, but it's not just as exciting as it was the first time. Let me tell you something, that will never be true of heaven. We will never ever say, I've seen it before. Oh, that's worn off now. What else is there? We will be absolutely blown away from day one for all eternity. Not just about what we see around us, but who we see. And who we spend time with. And you know who that is? The man of Calvary, the one who died on the cross, who took my sin and your sin on his own self, gave up his life. He who knew no sin became sin, so that we who were ridden with it could be saved. The simple way when it comes to glory is this. It's through faith. 
But you know, we've looked at the wall, we've looked at the gates, we've mentioned the precious stones, we've mentioned the river of the water of life, we've mentioned the throne of God and the blessings from it. But you know, there is one thing that never thrills me more than anything else about heaven. And do you know what it is? And it's something that amazes me, and I can't even begin to explain it. It's the one fact that God will allow a sinful rebel like me to share in his presence for all eternity. That's heaven for me. And I wonder this evening, you'll be glad to know I'm finished. Where do you stand? Only one life will soon be passed. I keep saying to young people that I meet, don't think you've got lots of time. Time passes too quickly. But I can look forward to, and I know others here can, of the day when the Lord will take us by the hand and he'll lead us through the promised land for a day, glorious day. That will be, will you be there? I will. And who knows, we may never meet again this side of eternity, but as we often, Charles and I, communicate, very often we e send our emails. It looks as if we're sending an email to ourselves. Uh, but we end the email by saying, we'll see you at the rapture. If not, at the meeting we had prepared. And I trust and I pray that every single one of you, I'll see you at the rapture. For the glory of God. Amen. Thanks so much for it's awesome uh, for the word of God to be read out and um, spoken on what the word says. Oh, it's powerful. You know, and old Satan, whenever he, he uh, tempted the Lord, the Lord just says, Get thee behind me, Satan. It is written. It was in the word. It's in the word for us too. You know, but uh, God is awesome. You know, uh,